Halloween is almost here again, and that means as Christians we have to ask ourselves again, is it just a day of harmless fun for the kids, or is it supernatural propaganda from the principalities and powers that the Apostle Paul warned us about? Welcome to Skywatch TV for Monday, October 24th, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. Last year at about this time, I produced a series of brief reports on the most common images, symbols that we see every year about this time, namely ghosts, witches, vampires, and werewolves. This year, as a primer in the week leading up to Halloween, I took those analyses and we present them now as one single report. Ghosts aren't just for Halloween anymore. An entire segment of the entertainment industry has developed around ghosts, hunting them, filming them, talking to them, and those are just the TV reality shows. Movies, radio plays, books, tales around the campfire, ghost stories have been around since at least the dawn of civilization. The ancient Mesopotamians certainly believed that the, a person's soul had an existence that continued after death. The Epic of Gilgamesh includes an account of the hero of the tale talking with his dead friend Enkidu. Relatives of the deceased in Mesopotamia had to leave food and drink offerings for the dead, or those spirits might return to cause trouble. In the Old Testament, it was understood that the spirits of the dead descended into Sheol, a place of darkness where both the righteous and the wicked endured a colorless existence cut off from the living. However, God found it necessary to tell Moses explicitly that trying to contact the spirits of the dead was forbidden. Apparently, this was a practice that was common in the ancient Near East. The concept of the ghost was obviously familiar to the apostles. Jesus' disciples were terrified as he walked toward them across the Sea of Galilee because they believed he was a ghost. But does that mean ghosts are real? Do the spirits of the dead really linger on earth waiting to conclude unfinished business? Well, no. At least not without special permission from God. There is only one example of what might be an actual ghost recorded in the Bible. It's in the book of 1 Samuel. The prophet Samuel had died, and King Saul was facing war with the Philistines, who apparently had David and his men fighting on their side. Saul was desperate for a word from God, but God wasn't talking to him. So the king disguised himself and went to the medium at Endor. And we read in 1 Samuel 28, the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. Now scripture doesn't give us any indication that the Elohim that came up from the earth was anything but the spirit of Samuel. But it's important to note that the spirit of Samuel appeared only with the permission of God, the assistance of God, and to pass along a message from God to Saul. It's possible that the medium cried out because she was shocked to see Samuel instead of the familiar spirit that normally came when she called out to the dead. Now what does the Bible say about what happens when we die? In Hebrews 9.27 it says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Judgment means either being with the Lord or in torment. There is no in-between. Are there spirits on earth? Absolutely. Angels and demons are real. But we humans are not well equipped to tell the difference between the two. Sometimes, as scripture tells us, the evil ones appear as angels of light. The apostle John warned us, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. You see, spirits can mimic the dead to deceive the living. So the next time you see a television show with a ghost hunter or a medium and they claim to be getting a message from somebody's late Uncle Fred, please remember, these people are playing with spiritual forces they obviously do not understand. God warned us not to contact the spirits for our own protection. These spirits are most probably demons, which means they are most definitely not friendly. Vampires have undergone a radical makeover. A hundred years ago, everyone knew vampires were monsters. Today, they're misunderstood. They're seductive, sexy, sophisticated, as likely to be cast in the role of hero in popular entertainment as not. If you know a young woman, you're probably familiar with the Twilight Saga, which has drawn millions of fans into the story of an awkward teenage girl, Bella, and her love interest, the painfully handsome, eternally young, 100-and-something-year-old vampire, Edward. 
popular television series like True Blood, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and Being Human, among others, are the result of a trend that began in the 1970s with the Vampire Chronicles novels of Anne Rice, the transformation of the vampire from monster into hero. But the fascination with vampires still has a dark side. A vampire subculture within the goth movement has emerged in the U.S. and Europe. In fact, inspired by a scene in the popular 1999 film Blade, blood raves, dances featuring the spraying of simulated blood over the crowd are planned this year in Amsterdam and New York. The precise origin of the vampire myth is shrouded in the mists of history. The first recorded use of the word, the old Russian upir, is found in a manuscript of the Book of Psalms that was translated into Cyrillic in the year 1047. However, demonic creatures resembling the modern vampire, evil spirits called idimu, were part of the cosmology of ancient Mesopotamia. Our modern concept of the sophisticated aristocratic vampire stems from the early 19th century. Dr. John Polidori, an associate of Lord Byron and Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, published a story in 1819 titled The Vampire. The villain of the tale, Lord Ruthven, is clearly a precursor of Count Dracula, the central character of Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, which defined the character and mythology of the vampire as we know it today. But even in the works of Polidori and Stoker, the vampire was absolutely evil, a parasite on the body of humanity that was exterminated only with extreme difficulty and with divine assistance. The most effective weapons against the vampire, as conceived by Stoker, symbolize key elements of the Christian faith. Holy water, representing baptism, and a sharpened piece of wood, representing the cross. Now that is absolutely appropriate. While we don't know exactly where the vampire myth began, we do know that God placed special significance on blood, especially human blood, from the very beginning of creation. When Cain murdered Abel, the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. The word blood is used nearly 400 times in the Bible. And in chapter 9 of the book of Genesis, God made it clear to Noah that blood has a unique property. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. In his novel, Dracula, Bram Stoker put the words, the blood is the life, in the mouth of Dracula's victim and servant, Renfield. In the 1931 movie starring Bela Lugosi, the scripture is quoted by the Count himself. Consuming the blood even of animals was absolutely forbidden. How much more than the blood of humans? As God told Noah, a reckoning is required, even from animals that shed the blood of humans. And yet, this has become the stuff of best-selling young adult novels and motion pictures. Think about this. Jesus Christ shed his blood so that others would have eternal life. The vampire sheds the blood of others so that he can have eternal life. That's 180 degrees opposite the life lived by Jesus and the eternal life that he bought, from, bought for us with his blood. Put simply, the vampire is not a hero. It is the very definition of Antichrist. As with ghosts, witchcraft, or sorcery, is documented in the oldest records of human history. The Code of Hammurabi, written about 4,000 years ago, includes penalties for those who cast spells on other people unjustly. Witchcraft is a very broad concept that differs between cultures, but in simple terms, it's the practice of performing some physical act, a ritual, speaking a set of words, or inscribing a rune or sigil on an object, to achieve a desired supernatural result, magic. And no wonder it's been with humanity since the beginning. I mean, who wouldn't want to wave a wand or speak a few words and get exactly what you want? And it makes for good entertainment, from Bewitched to American Horror Story, from Harry Potter to Frozen, from The Wizard of Oz to Maleficent. Stories about witches and magic always have an audience. How did humanity learn the art of witchcraft? The Book of Enoch suggests that the watchers who rebelled against Yahweh, the group of 200 who descended upon Mount Hermon, were responsible. 
Whether that's literally true or not, Enoch does document for us the belief among Jews during Old Testament times that the practice of casting spells did not originate with God. The ancient Egyptians and Babylonians were known for the high status magicians had in their societies. In fact, archaeologists have learned a lot about the history of the ancient Near East from the Egyptian execration texts. Names of the enemies of Egypt were inscribed on clay bowls or figurines, which were then smashed to curse those enemies, a concept similar to sticking pins into a voodoo doll. The modern English word witch is derived from Old English wicca. The first recorded use of the word is from the law code of Alfred the Great, King of Wessex, written about the year 890. Today, Wicca is a neo-pagan religion developed in the first half of the 20th century and introduced to the public in 1954. It's a duotheistic belief system that worships a goddess and a god, typically the moon goddess and a horned god, although Wicca includes a wide range of beliefs from polytheism to monotheistic goddess worship. Many witches draw a distinction between black and white magic, the black being the use of supernatural powers for selfish or evil purposes. However, God makes no distinction between the two, and he's very clear on the subject of witchcraft. Don't do it. Manasseh, king of Judah, was condemned by God for his many evil practices, including sorcery. The apostles had their encounters with sorcerers, Simon Magus, in the book of Acts, amazed Samaria with his magic and was later rebuked by Peter for wanting to buy the power of the Holy Spirit from the apostles. Paul had his run-in with one Elymas Bar-Jesus on the island of Cyprus. And in his letter to the Galatians, Paul named sorcery as one of the sinful practices of unbelievers, and he warned that those who engage in it will not inherit the kingdom of God. The book of Revelation is even more explicit. Sorcerers are promised a place in the lake of fire. This may hit uncomfortably close to home for some. There are aspects of this that hit close to home for me. Our daughter read all of the Harry Potter books when she was a kid. Um, how many of us with children or grandchildren haven't seen the movie Frozen about a dozen times? I don't mean to be flippant about this, but this is one of those issues where if we take the Bible seriously, and this is the Word of God after all, we may have to make some changes about the type of entertainment that we enjoy or even the way that we pray. And it may require some uncomfortable conversations with our children. Well, see, it's our job to train them up in the way they should go. And that includes teaching them about God's very clear warnings about witchcraft. Running a close second to the vampire in young adult fiction in recent years is the werewolf. Glamorized in movies such as the Underworld series, and especially the Twilight Saga, where hunky werewolf Jacob plays the rival to vampire Edward for the affection of the heroine, the teen girl Bella. The image of the werewolf has been transformed in recent years in much the same way as that of the vampire. As with vampires, ghosts, and witchcraft, the werewolf, or something like it, has been alongside humanity since the beginning of recorded history, and the stories come from all over the globe. The word werewolf means man-wolf, were is Saxon for man. But there are references to men transforming into wolves as far back as the ancient Greeks. Historian Herodotus, for example, in the 5th century BC, mentions a tribe called the Neuri that lived in what is now northern Ukraine and southern Belarus that reportedly turned into wolves for several days a year. Greek mythology includes the story of Lycaon, who is transformed into a wolf by Zeus for serving human flesh to the god as a test. Other stories of wolfmen appeared over the next few centuries in Greek and Roman literature. In Europe, the earliest recorded stories of the werewolf are from the 11th century, mainly in Germanic cultures. Pagan traditions associated with wolfmen persisted longest in Scandinavian countries, well into the Viking Age. In the 9th century, King Harold I of Norway used Ulfethnar, men clad in wolf skins, as berserkers or shock troops to unify Norway under his rule. Other Viking chieftains soon realized the value of these troops. Accounts of the Ulfethnar repeatedly mention their boundless rage in battle, biting their shields, unaffected by fire or swords, blunting their enemies' blades with spells or a glance from their evil eyes. The Ulfethnar were reputed to channel the spirits of wolves during battle, and they were closely associated with the chief Norse god, Odin. 
From a Christian perspective, it's not too far into the realm of speculation to suggest that something demonic was at work in the Ulfathnar. The berserkers were soon outlawed by Viking leaders and disappeared from history by the 12th century. But Scandinavian traditions may have influenced beliefs in Slavic cultures to the southeast as the Norsemen moved inland and founded what became the modern states of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. In the 11th century, Prince Veseslav the Sorcerer was believed to be a werewolf, as you can see on this 20-ruble coin minted in Belarus in 2005. Widespread belief in the werewolf myth took hold in Europe in the 15th century, about the same time that witch trials became more common. The most famous werewolf trial was that of Peter Stump, a wealthy German farmer called the Werewolf of Bedburg. After being stretched on the rack, Stump confessed to practicing black magic from the age of 12. He said that the devil gave him a magic belt that allowed him to transform himself into a powerful wolf, and that while he was in wolf form, he killed and ate 14 children and two pregnant women. Stump was executed, appropriately enough, on October 31st of 1589, and being the Middle Ages, his death wasn't pretty. Now, it's possible that wolves, as the most dangerous predator in Europe until the 20th century, were naturally projected into folklore as dangerous shapeshifters, and the werewolf legend was used to explain away serial killings. In Central and North America, the power to change shape was exclusive to sorcerers who were greatly feared. Among the Navajo, shapeshifters were called skinwalkers, and they were believed to be powerful witches who gained their abilities by breaking a cultural taboo. The modern image of the werewolf was shaped by the 1941 horror film The Wolfman, starring Lon Chaney Jr. as the ill-fated Larry Talbot. Talbot was transformed by the bite of a werewolf, played in the movie by Bela Lugosi, who created the role of Dracula on film. The Wolfman introduced the idea that werewolves are vulnerable to silver, although Larry Talbot's transformation did not occur only by the light of the full moon. Most of the werewolf accounts prior to the 20th century involved the creatures drinking human blood, eating human flesh, or both. As we mentioned in our report on vampires earlier this week, that's a taboo that God said must never be broken. Anthropologist Dr. Judd Burton, author of the book Interview with the Giant, Ethno-Historical Notes on the Nephilim, speculates that the legends of shapeshifters who cannibalize their victims may have originated with the Nephilim. The Book of Enoch records that the giants who were born of angels and human women oppressed mankind, and when their human subjects could no longer provide them with enough food, they ate them. It's not hard to understand why werewolves and vampires have become such popular characters in entertainment aimed at teens and young adults. It's a time when we were all awkward, uncomfortable in our own skin. Who wouldn't fantasize about a miraculous transformation into a being of supernatural strength and power, not to mention good looks? But whatever the origins of the legend, the werewolf, like the vampire, is, from a Christian perspective, fundamentally an abomination. Obviously, there are other myths and monsters I could have included in this report. Mummies, uh, zombies, especially popular right about now, uh, Frankenstein's monster, and so on. But my goal wasn't to put together a comprehensive look or analysis of Halloween, um, just a brief summary of the history behind some of the more common tropes that we see every year at about this time. It's not for me to tell you how to handle the hol holiday in, in five, four, three, two. Obviously, there are other monsters, myths, legends that I could have included as part of the report on Halloween, uh, mummies, zombies, uh, Frankenstein's monster. But my goal wasn't a comprehensive report on Halloween, just a brief look at the most common tropes, memes that we see every year around this time. It's not for me to tell you how to handle Halloween in your home. You know already, if you've got young children, that you've got a difficult choice to make. As a Christian, is this something that we should celebrate? Just wanted to present you with some information that you can use while you make up your mind. This week on Skywatch TV, an important book and a, uh, boy, if, if ever there was a guest that we could describe as an expert in his field, this would be it. Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, a Pentagon insider, still consults the Pentagon, um, talking about how technology and the transhumanist movement are changing the way we fight wars, but also changing what it means to be human 
How far do we go in developing technology to create super soldiers? What are the dangers of artificial intelligence? These are common themes around here at Skywatch TV because we're talking about technology that is literally, literally changing what it means to be homo sapiens. And frankly, most of the church is uninformed. You'll see the program tonight as he discusses his new book, Future War, on the Victory Television Network that will air at 8.30 tonight down on VTN. Tomorrow, four places, Victory Television Network, 6.30 p.m., also WGGN-TV in Sandusky, Ohio, WLLA-TV in Kalamazoo, Michigan at 7 p.m., and then Coast to Coast at 8.30 p.m. Central Time on the Christian Television Network, that's Direct TV Channel 376, Dish Network Channel 267, and the Glory Star Satellite Channel 117. Coast to Coast twice on Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Central Time on the Cornerstone Network, and then at 6 p.m. on World Harvest Television. That's DirecTV Channel 367, follows the Jim Baker program. On Thursday, the Victory Television Network again, 6 p.m. down there in Arkansas and around Memphis, and WLLA-TV in Kalamazoo at 6.30. And then Saturday, the Victory Television Network at 3.30, and WCLF-TV in Tampa at 6.30 p.m. Saturday night. You can see a complete listing of dates and times just updated now at the website, skywatchtv.com, click the link in the top menu bar that says channels. The program also available now on demand, on the Skywatch TV channel on Roku. And our Roku channel is where you can also get web exclusive content such as these daily news updates. But also this week, an interview with Colonel McGinnis, we couldn't fit into the network television schedule, a second discussion with Colonel McGinnis on the book, Future War, the transhumanist movement and how technology is literally, literally trying to rewrite the genetic code so that we can create better soldiers, but at what cost? It's the Skywatch TV channel on Roku, Skywatch TV channel on YouTube, and also skywatchtv.com. Now, if you need a more portable version of our programs, something that you can listen to while you're working, please download the Skywatch TV podcast, audio versions of all of our programs, the podcast updated seven days a week. You'll find it at skywatchtv.com, instructions on how to download it and the programs themselves. Just click the link in the top menu bar at our website that says podcast. And we've got one week to go in uh, October. Our gift, our thank you for your support this month, very timely. God's Ghostbusters, an anthology of essays from Christians on things that go bump in the night. Werewolves, vampires, ghosts, demons. We've got them all covered in that book. Essays from Chuck Missler, Tom Horn, Gary Bates, Russ Dizdar, many other authors, including yours truly. We will send you a copy of God's Ghostbusters for your donation of any amount during the month of October while supplies last. For more information and to donate, log on to skywatchtv.com slash donate. And of course, you can help us out just by clicking your mouse. Click like, click share, click subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And this week, my website, DerekPGilbert.com, an interview with filmmaker Trey Smith. You can watch it, you can listen to it. You'll find the links at DerekPGilbert.com. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please send those, but send those to me, dgilbert at skywatchtv.com. And thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. Skywatch TV can help you break through the barriers of space and time and get a valuable reference library at the same time. Here's what I mean. Maybe you weren't able to attend the Rocky Mountain International Prophecy Conference in July. That's a problem of space. Or maybe you were at the conference, but you had to choose. You could only watch one presentation at a time. No way to see all 53 presentations in real time. That's a problem of space and time. But thanks to modern digital technology, those barriers mean nothing. We can take you from your living room in the future to Colorado Springs in the past to watch all 53 presentations, many of which were recorded at the same time. And that's not even including the more than two dozen one-on-one -on -one interviews with all the speakers who were present. When you pre-purchase the complete DVD set from the Rocky Mountain International Prophecy Conference from Skywatch TV, you'll get all 53 presentations recorded live, plus the two dozen one-on-one -on -one interviews, and we will add the five-volume Researcher's Library of Ancient Text. That alone is a $150 value. Your cost, $149.95 plus shipping and handling. This is a limited time offer. Your opportunity to travel from your living room in the future to Colorado Springs in the past and watch all 54 presentations from the Rocky Mountain International Prophecy Conference without ever leaving your comfy chair. Time and space, no problem for Skywatch TV. Order now by calling 844-750-4985 or log on to skywatchtvstore.com.
longer on Earth waiting to conclude unfinished business? Well, no. At least not without special permission from God. There is only one example of what might be an actual ghost recorded in the Bible. It's in the book of 1 Samuel. The prophet Samuel had died and King Saul was facing war with the Philistines who apparently had David and his men fighting on their side. Saul was desperate for a word from God, but God wasn't talking to him. So the king disguised himself and went to the medium at Endor. And we read in 1 Samuel 28, the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out, or those spirits might return to cause trouble. In the Old Testament, it was understood that the spirits of the dead descended into Sheol, a place of darkness where both the righteous and the wicked endured a colorless existence cut off from the living. However, God found it necessary to tell Moses explicitly that trying to contact the spirits of the dead was forbidden. Apparently, this was a practice that was common in the ancient Near East. The concept of the ghost was obviously familiar to the apostles. Jesus' disciples were terrified as he walked toward them across the Sea of Galilee because they believed he was a ghost. But does that mean ghosts are real? Do the spirits of the dead really link? This year as a primer, in the week leading up to Halloween, I took those analyses and we present them now as one single report. Ghosts aren't just for Halloween anymore. An entire segment of the entertainment industry has developed around ghosts, hunting them, filming them, talking to them. And those are just the TV reality shows. Movies, radio plays, books, tales around the campfire, ghost stories have been around since at least the dawn of civilization. The ancient Mesopotamians certainly believed that the, a person's soul had an existence that continued after death. The Epic of Gilgamesh includes an account of the hero of the tale talking with his dead friend Enkidu. Relatives of the deceased in Mesopotamia had to leave food and drink offerings for the dead with a loud voice. Now, Scripture doesn't give us any indication that the Elohim that came up from the earth was anything but the spirit of Samuel. But it's important to note that the spirit of Samuel appeared only with the permission of God, the assistance of God, and to pass along a message from God to Saul. It's possible that the medium cried out because she was shocked to see Samuel instead of the familiar spirit that normally came when she called out to the dead. Now, what does the Bible say about what happens when we die? In Hebrews 9.27, it says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Judgment means either being... Halloween is almost here again, and that means as Christians we have to ask ourselves again, is it just a day of harmless fun for the kids, or is it supernatural propaganda from the principalities and powers that the Apostle Paul warned us about? Welcome to Skywatch TV for Monday, October 24th, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. Last year at about this time, I produced a series of brief reports on the most common images, symbols that we see every year about this time, namely ghosts, witches, vampires, and werewolves. 